Hey guys, this is John. I'm playing T.S. Kolur in the 15-minute pool on ICC. I'm opening with d4 against this opponent, 2087. He responds with knight f6. Let's just take a look at his stats. He has a peak rating of 2087. And he's at his peak, okay. All right, and maybe we'll get a Nimzo complex. The Nimzo Indian. Uh, instead, he plays d5. Okay, let's play the exchange variation against that, as is my preferred approach. Uh, and then c6. Yeah, this is a, a move order possibility that enables a quick bishop f5 for black. So I can try to prevent that with queen c2, or I can just play e3, and in the event of bishop f5, queen f3 is one possibility for white. Uh, I might play a different move, though. I'm actually thinking about playing knight g2, had he done it. Okay, he just plays knight bd7. Now we're probably going to get something pretty standard. Bishop e7, queen c2. You might recall I had a game against Wolflaw that I reached this position and I was talking about the difference between knight f3 and knight ge2. In this one, I'm going to try knight ge2, the slightly more aggressive move. This prepares f3 and e4 in the future. This is all standard, rook e8 making way for knight f8, and now we play f3. f3 always comes on move 11, that's how I remember it in this line. It's always 11 f3. He plays knight h5, so this offers a, a quick trade of the bishops, which I pretty much have to accept. And then, yeah, assuming he takes with the queen, this pawn is attacked twice. Defending it with knight d1 is out of the question, so I should just play e4 and advance in the center. It's unusual to be able to achieve the e4 advance this quickly. Uh, I'm trying to recall at the moment if I've had any games in this line. And I'm sure I have, I just don't recall how they went. Maybe, actually, I think I have had some games that have gone bishop e6 now. That's right. I had one game, an over-the-board game against FIDE master Sean Bibbert, who's a talented junior player from here in the States. And yeah, he played bishop e6, and I responded with e5, and then he went g6. Um, bishop e6 seems a little strange that black doesn't even take the pawn on e4, but um, black's hoping to close the position after this. And I believe e5 is just definitely the best move. Here I'm actually threatening g4, and that knight is stranded. So expect black to play g6, so the knight can drop back to g7. Okay, so it's nice that I have some bearings in this position. I think in the game against Vibbert, I played a move like queen d2, either now or very soon. Was it right now, or was it... Because one decision white has here is whether to play f4 or not. I can play pawn f4 looking to play f5, but if I play f4, almost certainly they're going to play f5 and try to lock down the center. And I remember thinking in the Vibbert game that it might actually be better not to play f4 for that exact reason. Like maybe keep the square open, and if black's going to play f5 anyways, maybe I don't have to waste a tempo locking it down. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to play that queen d2 move. I think this is useful. It just grabs control of this diagonal. My queen and bishop are probably not going to achieve much on the b1h7 diagonal. The bishop is fine on d3, but I just won't be able to like win a pawn or something down that diagonal, so I think this is all right. And I remember in the Vibbert game that I started preparing queenside play, and I think that's what I'll do here. So maybe rook a b1, trying to go b4, b5, our familiar minority attack idea. Yeah, let's do that. So... Initiate the pawn advance. It's possible he could try after b4 to play b5 and close things down. So I might wait to play b4. I think my rook is well placed here, and I'm probably going to send the other one over to c1. In the game I posted recently against Wolflaw, I tried a similar plan, like rook ab1, rook fc1. But uh, that was a little more volatile because... The center and and uh, the queen side, the king side, was was not closed. And here, these two areas of the board, center and king side, are likely to just remain closed. So there's a couple other new factors in the mix. Uh, so against a5, I'm thinking that a4 might be good. This is a common theme. I even referenced it in that game with Wolflaw. So if knight a4, what if he plays queen to b4? I guess I can play queen c2 in that case. 
guarding the knight and avoiding a queen swap. Yeah, that should be good. Okay, so let's do this. This also allows me to play knight b6. At some point, I could play it to attack that rook on a8, and if I could drive that rook away from defending a5, that would be nice. For the moment, though, I'm just happy to get this knight to a better square. Um, if I have several moves, I might play rook fc1, knight c5, and then a3, and finally b4. Okay, so he plays a knight move. And I feel okay playing rook fc1 because even though I'm somewhat abandoning my king, there's not really any way they can counterattack on the king side. We've got this dominant pawn on e5, this protected pass pawn. They blockaded it well, but um, there's no pawn breaks that are possible over here. We're controlling the g5 square, so they can't like put the queen here and try to go knight f4 or something or get into e3. This queen is a great piece on the square. Okay, so they pull the knight back. Probably an a3 and prepare b4. Um, a3 or knight, c knight c5 right away too. But I think starting with a3 makes sense. I bet what he's going to try to do is play bishop f7 and then play this knight to e6. I predict he's going to play that way. Okay, so let's go here. And on bishop f7, I think then knight c5. I think that would be a good moment to play knight c5. So that if knight takes knight, rook takes, I'm attacking a5. Ah, then they could play a4, though. Maybe that will slow me down. Hmm. So let me rethink that. Maybe I should play knight f4 now and kind of preempt knight e6. Yeah, because knight c5, knight takes knight, rook takes, knight on c5, a4. That move could be pesky. Supported by the rook. Yeah, maybe knight f4 is just a better option right now. They could try after knight f4 to pin me with uh, queen to g5, but I think I can play rook c2 and escape that pin. Yeah, let's do this. I would almost guarantee you this is a setup that this player has used before. Uh, this whole approach with like bishop e6, g6, f5. Uh, it, it's consistent with the move knight h5 and move 11. So he's probably done this before in games. It, it's kind of reliable for black. I mean, you get a closed position. I do feel white's often just better in these positions, but the position is closed enough to make it difficult. All right, so he responds aggressively with g5. Now, I could drop the knight back to e2, or I could go to h3, but h3, it seems like the knight might be out of play there. I wonder if I play knight e2, what his follow-up will be. Because then he can't go knight f5, because the pawn on f5 is loose. Okay, I'm just going to play this, because I think knight h3 looks suspicious. I don't really want to send my knight onto the to the edge of the board like that. Let's see what his follow-up is. He plays f4. Okay. So gaining a little space on the king side. This is a bit fragile, the f4 and g5 pawns, but I see his point. Do I play g3 and try to undermine? Maybe. Maybe I'll be switching back to the king side to play. g3, f3 is weak then, but I can always play rook back to f1. I kind of think I should play g3 because it doesn't look like I'm getting much of anywhere on the queen side. I know I've been gearing up for that, but you have to be willing to change your plan if... Um, the situation demands it. So g3 looks pretty decent. Okay, let's do it. So if takes, I have a choice between knight takes and pawn takes back. I'm kind of liking the look of knight takes g3. Then that knight is employed, and if ever that knight were to leave g7, like say it goes to e6, I would have knight f5. It's kind of the idea I'm banking on there. Could also play h takes and try to roll him with f4 to come, but somehow this capture just looks best. Let's see if he tries something like h5, h4, looking to boot the knight from g3. If he does that, I think I'll play after h5, maybe king h1, and try to bring the rook over to g1. I don't know that he wants to throw the kitchen sink at me quite yet. 
I mean, he's weakened his king a little bit by playing f4 and g5, but I don't know if following up with h5 would be the way to approach the position. Plays bishop g6. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So he's basically saying, like, I don't mind the double isolated pawns because I get control over a key square. I get protection on f5. Yeah, probably a good move. I think he is correct to play that. Now, my dilemma is that if I take and then take again, like, this knight's going to have a hard time finding something to do. So let's say bishop takes g6, h takes g6, maybe f4. Because he's playing knight e6 next move almost no matter what. And then also d4 would be under attack there. I have to bear that in mind. So bishop takes g6, h takes g6, let's say f4. And then let's say g takes f4, queen takes f4, knight e6, maybe queen g4 then. I think I probably retain some edge there. Yeah, let's do that. Because I just don't want him to play knight e6 and blockade that f4 square. If he does that, I don't think I have any advantage. I think all my advantage is slipping away after that. This is a backward pawn on f3. Kind of stymied by his pawn on g5. So I want to advance it and get rid of it. It's slightly concerning that I have so many pieces over here on the queen side, my two rooks and the uh, knight. But I think they'll be able to enter the game probably through the f-file. Yeah, almost certainly we're going to be lining up our rooks on the f-file very soon. Knight e6 as expected, and I think queen g4 is a good move. So attack this pawn. Maybe he'll play queen g5 and seek further trades. Yeah, he does. Okay, so if I take, knight takes... Maybe rook f1. That knight will still be good blockading on e6. I sort of have to trade queens now, though. I don't really have an option in that respect. So let's do it. Now he's threatening knight f3 check, followed by knight takes d4. So I think this is necessary. Let's see how he plays this. I think my opponent has played well. I really haven't got much this game. I think he's resisting admirably. Resisting my first move advantage, that is. <laughs> yeah, now knight f3 check is a threat again. So king g2. King g2, knight e6. And I probably have to play knight e2. Maybe knight e2 immediately is slightly better. Nah, but I think I should play king g2 and just rule out that possibility altogether. Yeah, let's do that. So knight e6, knight e2. Uh, this knight needs to make its way back into the game somehow. I mean, c3 is the only available square, really. This may not be a bad line for black for players who kind of enjoy playing closed or semi-closed positions. Because as you can see, you can get pretty far into this line. Like the path I followed in this line is like really standard. And it's kind of forcing. When you play knight h5, you force the dark square bishop trade. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, let's come here. Let's see if he'll follow with b4. If so, then I'll have to debate between knight e2 or knight back to a4. No, instead knight b6. Okay, so maybe he's trying to come into the c4 square. Makes sense. Hmm, pesky. I might be somewhat worse here, because knight c4 is a pretty annoying resource. 
mean, I have this this nice pawn in the center on e5, but uh, it's not going anywhere. It's always blockaded, and he can start playing with this queenside majority now. It's basically what he's doing. B3 would be natural, but I'm not sure I want to play B3. Might also want to take here, but even that I'm a little skeptical of. So if I take on f8, he takes with his rook. What's happening then? Then he's got control over the file. I still have to deal with knight coming in. Yeah, that, that doesn't look so good to me. Hmm. This is tricky. But I think I almost have to trade one pair of rooks. I mean, it almost seems inevitable. Like, rook takes f8, rook takes f8. Where to go from there? c6 is weak, but how do I attack that? It's so difficult. Rook takes f8, rook takes f8, b3, but then rook f3, maybe? There's so many moves he could play. This is the point in the game where you really want to play your opponent's position. <laughs> I would love to be black here. Yeah, b5, knight, b6. Good plan. Don't see a lot of good follow-ups. Okay, I'm going to take Check. once and then probably play rook c1 or b3. I mean, maybe slight preference for b3, but I I'm a little worried about rook f3 as a reply. All right, got a chance it though. Let's see what happens. I think allowing the knight into c4 is a very bad idea for me. I need to keep that knight out. Because if he gets into c4, he's attacking b2, and he has access to e3. All these squares. Okay, so he just drops the knight back. Okay, that makes me feel slightly better. Um, I can play one of my knights to e2. Which one is the question? If this knight goes to e2, then a4 is a concern. So let's send this one in to e2. And maybe rook c1? Trying to... c6 is like one of the few weak points they have. And on the queen side, it's the only weak point. So I'm just trying to like minimize the effect of an a4 or a b4 move from them. Hmm. King g7, patient. Probably rook c1 now. Rook wasn't doing anything on the b file. So at least I can try to line up against this pawn. So if they play like b4, I can play a takes b4, a takes b4, knight a2. And then I'd be attacking c6 and b4. So that would not be good. So maybe I'll have time to reposition my pieces a little bit. King g3 might not be a bad idea if I get a chance. Okay, are they going to go for c5 now? And do I care if they do? No, I don't think so. I think I should just do this. I gotta play faster now. Time pressure is looming. So if rook c8, maybe knight to e3, threatening knight takes d5. c5, they're gonna force the pace. Okay, so I should probably take there. I can also play knight here though. No, but I think taking's better. Now I was thinking b4. Try to save my... He's playing very fast still. Rook c6. Hoping I'm not running into any tactics. f2 is covered, so we've got that going for us. So now we have multiple pawn weaknesses each. Um, my b4 and e5 pawns are undoubtedly quite weak, but so are his d5 and b5 pawns. Mm, this is still going to be a struggle, though. 
I got to play very accurately from this this point forward. Okay, uh, let's come here with the rook. Go after that B pawn. I just want to neutralize that pawn. 154 to my opponent's 8 minutes. Sometimes chess is like this. I mean, I was happy with the position I got out of the opening, but gradually the position just didn't go my way. I, I can't even off the top of my head pinpoint where that is. We'll see in the analysis. But um, as I've talked about in the Climbing the Rating Ladder series, you just have to be ready to switch gears in chess and switch over to defense if necessary and not respond uh, emotionally to a decision or a position that has not gone your way. The worst thing I could do here is despair that I'm down time and I'm defending a worse end game. I need to stay alert. I need to look for all my uh, counterattacking chances and see if I can get back in the game. Okay, here he's letting me pin him with rook to b7. He'll play rook e7 in that case. But still, I think I should seize that opportunity. Let's do that. So if I play knight d4, what is he doing? Knight d4, knight takes b4, knight takes b5. Okay. I can also play knight c3, but I, somehow this seems even better. I don't know, actually. I'm not sure which knight I should have used for that. Maybe knight c3 was more accurate. Downtime, so I, I don't have the luxury of spending too long to think about that. Hmm. Yeah, he defends his king, or defends his uh, rook, rather. Knight here. Rook d7. e6 check isn't quite working there. e6 check right now, he has knight takes e6. So that's nothing. Hmm. I see a draw though. Knight c6, rook d7, knight b8. Given the time situation, I think I should take that. Unless I find something really good here in the closing minutes. Closing seconds. I'm just not sure, because rook d7, it looks like I should have uh, e6, but I'm... I don't think king take... after king takes e6, there's nothing. No forks. I could have taken on b5 on the previous move, but that would have just been a trade. I would lose my e5 pawn, and the game would continue with me having less than a minute on, on my clock. I think he's going to have to agree to the perpetual here. Rook d7, knight b8. Check. Knight f4 instead. Okay. That is surprising. Let's come here. Really? So he's going to continue like this. Now I got to hustle. Not a lot of time. Surprised he's going to do it like this. So I'm threatening knight takes d5 and knight takes b5. Yeah, he plays a king move. That's correct from the looks of it. I'm going to come here. I couldn't take there because he would actually um, win a piece, I believe. 33 seconds remaining. So knight takes b5 is coming up next. Now I think I might be winning. Let's pre-move this recapture. If d3, I can just take c7. Because then if d2, I have rook d6. Yeah, he's uh, he's losing now. It'll just be a, a situation, can I beat the clock? That is a very surprising decision. Move 44, knight f4 check. Again, we're going to go back and look at that after this, but... 
Maybe he just didn't see rook d7, or he didn't want to draw. He thought he could blitz me out. But rook d7 was a very obvious move. Now he's going to play knight take c7, most likely. And I'm going to win the d-pawn. Yeah, he just resigned. Wow, what a turn of events. So I'm just defending this entire endgame. Basically, I think from the moment that he played bishop g6, that was an excellent move, bishop g6. Offering to double up his pawns, but in the process, uh, if I were to take that exchange, get some nice squares. So let's go back and have a look at this. I'm going to skip some of the opening discussion. If you're interested in um, the opening discussion, search my channel for uh, Queen's Gambit Declined or Exchange Variation, Queen's Gambit Declined Exchange Variation. And there's a lot of discussion about uh, Knight F3 versus Knight GE2 on move 9. Uh, the game against Wolf Law is also worth checking out. So this is all standard. I play f3 in preparation for e4. And then knight h5. And because of the attack on the pawn, I should push it here, e4. And now bishop e6. So this is the first moment where um, the battle lines will be drawn. Because after e5, the center is becoming closed. And play is going to shift to the flanks. And as I said, I've, I've played all of this before. Uh, g6. So note that after e5, the knight's flight square to f6 has been taken away, so white is threatening g4 at this stage. So he plays this, and I was trying to recall that game with Vibbert, uh, and I might post that game too if I can find it. I'm actually pretty positive it's in my database. f4 would be normal here, so trying to play f5, but again, they're not going to let us play f5. They're going to play f5 himself and put a stop to that. And then taking on Passant, I think, is a bit risky because it leaves this pawn isolated. Knight takes f6. Um, I can play f5, but I'm not really sure that this bothers black too much. They're pretty solid here. And white's pawn structure is kind of just worse in the long run. So I played queen d2. They played f5. And I don't think I'm really achieving much on the king side ever because he's so well entrenched with his pawn structure and the center is closed. So the queen side is like the natural place to play for white, in my opinion. So hence I played rook a b1, prepping b4. He played a5, putting a stop to that. And you'll notice the computer is just giving me a solid advantage, but I don't really trust the computer eval fully. Um, I think the computer is probably overestimating white's center. It really likes the fact that white has a protected pass pawn in the center, and it's maybe uh, not giving proper credence to black's blockading potential. Basically, black via this maneuver, knight g7, and then bishop to f7, knight to e6, gains an excellent blockade, the knight perfectly placed in front of a protected pass pawn. If you're going to have a piece to blockade a protected pass pawn, you want it to be a knight, usually. And it's not easy for white to make progress in these positions. Um, so I played a3, bishop f7. Huh, <laughs> that's funny. The computer was suggesting to move rook a1 for a second here for white. I don't know what rook a1 would do. Oh, well, maybe the point of rook a1 is to um, enable b4, actually. Maybe there is a method to that madness. Because now, uh, after b4 and a subsequent exchange, I wouldn't have to worry about rook takes a4. My own rook would be defending. <laughs> so I was about to um, poo-poo the computer's suggestion, but maybe maybe that's there's something to be said for that. But knight f4 seems good. I mean, I stopped knight e6. So he just started bull rushing me with his pawns on the king side, though. I thought he would be kind of hesitant to do this, but he showed no hesitation. So we're 21 moves in. He's used three minutes. I've used a little over five. And from here, my, my task started to become difficult. G3. The computer likes maybe queen c2. Yeah, I like that move too in retrospect because that doubles up and attacks the h7 pawn, and it rules out bishop g6. Bishop g6 would now just lose a pawn. Take and take again. Uh-huh. So yeah, maybe I have to take more care in uh, preventing or discouraging bishop g6. I play g3, just seeking play on this wing. Yeah, now he replies with that move. So even here I made a mistake. h takes g3 is much stronger, apparently. Maintaining the integrity of my pawn structure, maybe allowing those pawns to advance in tandem. f4, f5. What happens if bishop g6 now? Here I can take and then play king h2. Yeah, and if this knight gets to e6, it's much better that I have a pawn on g3 than if I have a knight on g3. With the knight on g3, there's little I can do about him playing knight f4 eventually. 
But with a pawn on g3, I'm always guaranteeing against that possibility. So I took with the knight, but all right. So at least now I'm able to identify kind of where I went wrong. I played some moves that seem natural at the time, but are not the best in retrospect. Yeah, knight takes g3. That looks like a question mark move. That's a, that's a mistake. Bishop g6. The worst part is it's pretty easy to play black's position. I mean, just looking at this, like, let me even flip this around. You can kind of see. Uh, these pawns control so much territory. And he's got this convenient 96 move, which is going to attack my weak pawn on d4 and also I the f4 square. So I think I have to act quickly because I need to break up his structure. As weird as that seems, I need to break up his double isolated pawns. Because otherwise, this pawn is probably never going to be able to move. He's going to play knight e6, rook here. He might double rooks. Um, he might play knight f4 somewhere. It's, it's tough to find anything useful for me if he gets that in. So take, queen takes, knight e6, queen g4. Yeah, and he just played for a better endgame, queen g5. Okay, so right around here is becoming obvious to me that I was just worse. Um, and why is that? Well, it's mainly due to uh, easy play, ease of play, and the available targets. So looking at his position, he doesn't have a lot of pawn weaknesses that I can attack. Material is equal. I mean, piece play wise, um, you know, my pieces are probably still slightly worse than his. Like he's going to maneuver his knight into e6 and it's going to have good options there. But um, the pawns are really what characterize this because this pawn on d4, it supports e5. So this is a necessary little unit. But that pawn needs like constant protection from my knights or my rooks. And he can simply put the knight on e6, and that's going to tie at least one of my pieces down. And I can't really afford to assign a rook to the defense of that pawn. I need it to be a knight, so like, inevitably I think one of my knights is going to have to come back to e2. And I can't really get at his pawn weaknesses, which are b7 and g6. And you can kind of see at no point was I able to really go after that until much, much later when he was already opening up the c file. So his superior activity, mainly with the knights, and also... Um, the vulnerability of my d4 pawn. That's that's why black is four choice here. Computer actually thinks it's close to equal, but it certainly didn't feel like that during the game. I thought this position was pretty tough for me. Check. I think I found the right way. Rook takes f8 because now that he's played knight b6, like knight c4 is uh, an immediate threat, and then he's attacking the pawn on b2 and looking at e3 as well. Check. So rook takes f8. He took with the rook. I played b3. One move I was wondering about here was rook f3, trying to attack along the third rank. I guess I can play rook c1. This is a unstable uh, arrangement for him, the knight on g5 protecting the rook, because I can play h4 and try to boot his knight and go after his rook. But I was thinking like maybe he could do something like b4 and, I don't know, uh, after this knight moves like grab here, but I guess this is always giving me excellent counterplay. This is under attack. Oh yeah, and I have rook takes g6 too, forking the king and the knight should this knight move. Those are just details that are kind of hard to appreciate when you have limited time remaining. I mean, it certainly felt like he had this psychological initiative here after rook takes f8 and b3. So he played knight e6. I just played knight ge2. Seems more logical to use this knight because it sidesteps b4 and opens the c-file, but then, like, what is that knight doing on g3? It has nowhere to go. It's just spectating. And I don't think I can afford to shut down one of my knights. I need I need them operating together. Uh, not that this knight is going to be amazing after knight ge2, but it at least has better prospects than the knight on g3, I think. So, with knight ge2, we guard d4, and we also guard f4. And it seems like right around here he kind of lost the thread a little bit because I was able to organize rook c1 and the c-file play gave me um, much to be happy about as my time was dwindling. So what to do for him? I mean, he could consider moves like a4 or b4, but I've set up my position such that a4 isn't really scary because I always just take. Um, oh yeah, that's the other thing. If I use this knight, I think a4 would be a good move. Because after takes, he could take with his knight. Um, I, I wouldn't have knight takes a4 in reply. And this structure looks excellent for black. He's got b5, c6, d5. Yeah, c6 is a little bit weak, but a3 is kind of stranded, and I think here he's somewhat better as well. 
So that's another reason to keep this knight around here for a moment, guarding a4. And if b4, I can just take and then play knight a2, I believe. And I'm going to be attacking that pawn. So he played king g7. I went rook c1. I was happy with that move. I need to get my uh, rook working in the position. This move seems dubious according to the engine. Knight d1. He really dislikes that move. Hmm. Seemed natural to me, uncovering the rook on c6. It says I should just gain some space and more or less sit still here. I guess if I sit still and keep the knight on c3, I am discouraging c5 because my knight is attacking those pawns, but... Um, hmm. Yeah, and time pressure, your, your natural instinct is always going to be to play actively. Either that or just... Uh, if you have absolutely nothing to do, just sit there and move your pieces back and forth. But more often than not, you're going to be looking at ways to create threats and try to um, like get your opponent thinking about your threats rather than you just responding. So hence I played knight d1, but yeah, after c5, the advantage again swinging back to black's favor. It did kind of seem like that. Here. Hmm. I just played b4 because my pawn's under attack. And I didn't like having to defend it. Knight d4, that's a nifty move. Not a move I considered. So that defends the b3 pawn. And the point is, if they take, I can take on c5. We're attacking these guys. Well, actually, just the d5 pawn. Hmm, knight d4 is creative. Yeah, I didn't see that move. Still gives black an advantage after knight f4 check. Instead, I played b4. He took knight d3. So for the moment, black's playing fine. But at least now I felt like my pieces were active, and especially that rook can go and create some threats. So rook in, and here knight ef4 is recommended Check. by the engine, and then take rook takes, going after the b pawn probably. And also the e5 pawn is in the sights of the knight, and this knight is not participating. Okay, and black's quite a bit, well, not quite a bit, but better here. Maybe they're going to win a pawn somehow. Probably just based on how weak those pawns are. What if I play a move like rook d6? Rook takes b4, take here. Oh, I can't take there. Knight f4. Ha! Fork on the, the king and the rook. Yeah, that would have been tricky. Check. Bring this knight in, take, and then recapture with the rook. Keep this knight active. At minimum, um, he can just gather my b or my e pawns and pretty much guarantee a draw, but he's pushing for the win, certainly with uh, the positional advantage and the time advantage, too. But he played rook e8, a little defensive, and then I went here. Now I felt okay. I felt like if I played accurately enough, I could save it, even with less than two minutes. Yeah, and that seems to be a mistake, walking into a pin on the seventh rank. So it wasn't too late for him to just do something to avoid a pin, grab a pawn. What if this now? Knight back to d3. Okay, slim advantage for black now. I have a b-pawn versus his d-pawn. Probably a draw is going to be the correct result from here. The time puts everything up for grabs, but um, probably a draw is the correct result if that happens. Yeah, because after this, they just very begrudgingly had to play rook e7. Okay, and now knight d4. All right, so maybe I did choose the, the best knight move. I was thinking this move was also possible, too. I can't re quite recall why I chose one of those moves over the other. There's something about, I think I like the fact that knight d4 allowed me to come into c6. I think that was the determination. Because yeah, after king f7, I did play knight c6. And I was commenting that if rook d7, I might just have to take a draw. Knight b8 attacking the rook. Rook comes here, and knight c6. And I'm pretty sure that's what I would have done. And with that amount of time, I didn't have uh, much in the tank uh, on my clock to, to consider anything else. The computer says knight c3 is very good here. Mm, yeah, I could see that. I mean, I, I am threatening this now. Um, oh man, that would be a risky proposition, though. Trying to play this for a win with 30-odd seconds left. Yeah, I probably would have taken the draw. But very surprising, Check. he um, he checked on f4, and then I go king f3, and all of a sudden he has two pieces under attack, and also this knight is uncertain. He played knight e6, I took, he took, knight c3, and yeah, even though I was still very down on time, uh, the position has simplified. Okay, so here he set a trap, king d8, 
if I just blindly take on b5, he takes back, rook takes, and then Check. guess what? We lose the game. Fork and his two pawns remaining are going to be enough to carry this. So, not going to get overexcited. Just going to play king g4, sidestepping any checks, and trust that this pawn is going to fall. Yeah, he can't defend that. He could try to run the d pawn once again, but I, I'm just taking here. Yeah, and again, if d3, I'm sure I have some way out of this. Here, I'm threatening to take this with check. How would that work? If d2, knight takes e6, check, king e8, there must be a way to stop that pawn. Ah, just rook b8, check, followed by rook d8. Yeah, so if something like this, check. this is winning, because if king here, I can check. check and then play rook here, getting behind the pawn. If king here, I can check, check and then get over to d8, again, behind the pawn. Yeah, so his d-pawn isn't enough at this point. He tried to run it in the game, but it's we're just trading stuff off and getting behind it. Yeah, and he, he resigned here. He didn't want to test my... Test my speed. <laughs> yeah, because we're going to gather the pawn. We're going to send the rook back to d6, go take g6, and it's just a win. My h-pawn will advance, or one of my pawns. So, yeah, very good game by T.S. Kolur. I mean, he found some nice moves. Like, bishop g6 was especially nice uh, right on move 23. Good resource right there. I think um, maybe he could have spent his time a little more wisely. I mean, I don't know. He was putting me under significant pressure. I mean, if he had made just one or two different decisions, I might have been saying that the only thing he did wrong in this game was, um, well, I guess nothing. <laughs> if he had played correctly and you know, maybe played a move like, where were we saying? Right back here, like knight f4 check instead. I mean, he'd still have very good winning chances. Uh, and my time management would be to blame. But um, yeah, as played, I mean, he definitely erred at the end in in missing or not playing rook d7. I think you just have to play rook d7 here. Like knight f4 check and giving up the exchange is not the way to go. Uh, but interesting game nonetheless. And I'll try to find that game with uh, Fide Master Sean Bibbert that I played a few years ago. I believe it was at the Chicago Open. So thank you guys for watching. I'll be back tomorrow with another video. Talk to you guys later. Bye.